Well, good evening, everybody. Uh, it's my pleasure to welcome you to a uh, NYU Abu Dhabi uh, Public Institute lecture by Brenda Andrews. Um, my name is Chris Gonzalez. I'm a professor of biology at uh, NYU in New York and also an affiliated professor in NYU Abu Dhabi. Um, this uh, public uh, lecture is affiliated with a conference which we're having. It's our third annual Genomics and Systems Biology Conference that we've been holding in NYU um, AD. Uh, since we've started our research activities here. And um, uh, Brenda is a very uh, prominent Canadian scientist who uh, is the director of the Donnelly Center uh, for Cellular and Biomolecular Research uh, in Toronto. They have a beautiful building a, and she's assembled an amazing group of colleagues who are very collaborative and they're working to understand uh, using very high throughput, very systematic approaches, the um, mechanistic functional landscape of both model, organism, uh, model organisms like the single cell yeast, as well as uh, human cells. Um, and uh, it's really been for our center in New York and also here one of the role models of how to establish a very collaborative um, high-spirited, very productive, high-quality science endeavor. Um, she's been really an inspiration to me personally, so I'm very honored to be doing this. Um, Brenda uh, received her PhD in um, biophysical um, medicine at something like that at the University of Toronto. Um, she then went on to do a postdoc with Ira Herskowitz, who's one of the luminaries of um, genetics. Um, and she's, uh, in, in her postdoctoral work, she studied um, cell cycle uh, regulation of the model system yeast, as I mentioned, a single-celled organism that we know um, more as brewer's yeast. Um, and for most of the scientists in the room, I think they'll understand the importance of this organism for um, developing biomolecular uh, research in the 20th century. But for people who are not um, so well-versed in the history of the science, um, I'd just like to say that um, Lee Hartwell, for example, won a Nobel Prize for discovering that yeast have these genes that put on the accelerator or the brakes for the cell cycle, for cells to, to uh, replicate their DNA and to uh, reproduce and multiply. And it turns out that many of the genes which were discovered in this lowly organism are very well conserved throughout the uh, animal kingdom, plant and animal kingdom, and that 70, for example, 70 of the cell cycle regulatory, oops, I'm sorry, I'm giving Brenda's talk by accident, <laughs> only I would have to make it up. <laughs> um, so about 70 of the cell cycle regulatory genes in yeast um, can be actually re replaced by the human homologs and the yeast will function perfectly. So this gives you an idea of how well conserved these genes are and how very fundamental and important they are um, for cell biology. Um, many of these genes are what are, we will now refer to in, in human cells as oncogenes or tumor suppressor genes. And so um, the genetics of yeast has really been instrumental in um, really laying the groundwork for a lot of the um, uh, applied medical research that people are now doing to really dissect um, how tumor cells, for example, proliferate and are regulated. Um, the field of genetics is a very interesting, I think, um, discipline because what one has to do in this as field is to try to um, break something and then understand how the organism responds to breaking something and then try to infer functions from it. And so we have a lot of uh, informatic methods that we can compare. We've sequenced many, many, many genomes now and we can compare all the sequences and we can classify genes according to their different functions. But really the only way that we really know what they're doing in vivo inside or live organisms is to actually just try to break them and then see what happens. And uh, so I'm going to just give a small analogy which all the scientists I think have heard but maybe other people haven't and it will give you some appreciation for what geneticists do, um, which is pretend you're an alien coming from outer space and you land on the earth and you see all these people running around doing these strange things that you don't have any idea what they're doing and you come upon what we would call a, an automobile factory but you don't really know what it is. And you observe this building and you see this, there, this structure that there are a bunch of people dressed in orange suits that go in in the morning and yellow suits that go in in the morning and black suits with ties and jackets that go in in the morning. And uh, you decide to try to figure out what's going on in this black box that you see. And so what you do is one day you just take away all the yellow people and 
hide them in the forest and feed them mangoes or something for the day. And then watch what happens to the, to the cars that come out. So you see people go in in the morning and then cars come out during the day. And then if you take away the people in the yellow suits, you find that the car comes out but it has no steering wheel and actually the cars can't be guided. Or you take away the red suits and you find the cars come out with no wheels and they can't go anywhere. Um, and then the joke is that you take away the guys with the suits and ties and you find out the cars come just fine, so they're not really <laughs> serving any important function. Anyway, um, so this is sort of the fundamental idea of genetics, and Brenda's group has taken this in, to an entirely different level of doing very high throughput and completely systematic studies in these organisms, and it's really set the example, I think, around the world uh, for, for a lot of the uh, work that we do now. Um, the yeast actually only has 6,000 genes. Humans have about, we're not sure exactly, maybe 25 to 50,000. But yeast have a very small genome, and humans have an enormous genome. And this, this has to do with very many reasons historically, but there's a lot of extra stuff in the human genome that has to do with you know, transposons and repetitive DNA and things. Um, so it, it makes, under, but we know that many of the functions are similar. So it makes looking for the, understanding the functions, dissecting the functions, instead of looking for a needle in a haystack, I'm almost done. It, it's more like looking for a needle in a giant pile of toothpicks, which still is a very big project, but it, the, the, the number of parts and the context of the biology is a little bit more controllable, and so you, you have a little bit more hope of eventually figuring out what's going on. Uh, so after she studied with uh, Ira Herskowitz, she went back to Toronto. She became, again, she recently became the director of this group, and recently, 10, 10 something years ago. How, I don't know how long you've been director of this thing. But she also is uh, the um, chair uh, of the Banting and Best Department of Medical Research in the Faculty of Medicine in Toronto. She's a uh, fellow of the Royal Society uh, in Canada. She, she's on lots of editorial boards. She has lots of other awards and advisory boards and things. She's on our advisory board because she's a very prominent scientist. Um, and she also recently took on the role of founding, edit, founding editor-in-chief of, of a new magazine. It's an op open uh, access magazine called G3, Genes, Genomes, Genetics. And um, I thank you for only sending me about six papers a year that I have to do the reviews for. But. Um, it's a wonderful thing because it provides uh, very good research for people who can just um, immediately have access. And we all believe here that knowledge should be free and open and accessible to the entire human community. And uh, I think I will stop embarrassing myself and just say, Brenda, please, please uh, welcome to the eat and uh, give a, we'll look forward to giving your talk. Thank you. Well, thank you very much for that uh, wonderful introduction, um, both very generous introduction to me, but also a great introduction to my lecture, so I can skip through multiple slides, because I think Chris did a better job in describing it than, than I'm going to do. But what I'm, I'd like to do today is uh, tell you a little bit about work that my laboratory has been doing to address this general question here, uh, what does your genome say about who you are? And the reason I'm in a position to really discuss this question today is because the last decade or so has, been, has seen what most scientists would say is a paradigm shift in the way that we do biomedical research. And that shift has resulted from a very um, beautiful interplay between technology development and biology, which means we've developed great ways and, and very rapid ways to sequence genomes. And Chris was talking about this field of genomics that's emerged from this. So our ability to rapidly produce genome sequences very cheaply means that we can now take quick views at even our human genome sequences and try to understand what that means in health and disease. And what's become apparent is that we really don't understand that much about how genomes work, and to really understand how they're perturbed in disease, we need to understand how genes work together to create healthier disease cells. And we've been using model systems to do this, and I'll describe a little bit about some of the work we've been doing to make maps of cells to help us understand how genes interact. So I'll begin my lecture by giving you a very brief introduction to uh, the field of genomics and uh, the history of the Human Genome Project, which led to these great advances I just mentioned in genome sequencing technology. And then this has posed a number of questions for scientists over the last few years, which has demanded uh, very interdisciplinary approaches between computer scientists and biologists to understand how we interpret genome sequences and the big question of how do we infer phenotype, and that means how organisms or cells look, from genotype, and that's the information in our genomes. 
And we really don't understand how to do this very well yet. And it's, I think it's a major frontier in all of biomedical research at the moment. So we need to address this challenge in many ways. And one way is to uh, map how genes interact to function in biological pathways and make cells work. And we do this by mapping genetic networks. And I'll tell you a little bit about that project today. I'll begin by reminding you uh, that genes, as Chris just said, are the units within our cells that reside on chromosomes that encode all of the proteins that are building blocks of cells. And these proteins determine how cells and organisms act, how they behave, how they respond to infections. Pretty much everything about an organism is determined by the proteins that are encoded by the genes. Whoops. Uh, whoops. <laughs> encoded by the genes. And so this means, and this sort of uh, le led to the idea that if we decode the genome, if we reveal all of the information in the genome by sequencing it, for example, then we'll be able to understand how cells work. And so that seems like a reasonable idea. All the information's there. We know that that information is sufficient to make an organism. If we decode it, we'll understand it. And so this has really motivated the field of genomics, which is a relatively young science. Um, about in the, in the early 1970s, a technology for sequencing DNA was invented, but it was a very chemical, chemically based, slow sequencing method, and it was applied to do the first genome sequences in the 1980s of very small organisms, very small genomes of viruses and bacteria. It wasn't until the 1990s where the, what people call the genomics era really ensued, where we were able to, that sequencing technologies had advanced enough that we were able to contemplate sequencing much larger genomes, like our genomes. And so in this, at this time, the Human Genome Project was begun. And in the scientific community, this was met with actually a great deal of skepticism because the technology really wasn't that good at the time. People wondered if it could actually be feasibly completed and it was going to cost billions and billions of dollars. But nonetheless, a consortium of scientists got together and started this remarkable project, which was completed um, in the early thousands, the first 2000s, the first draft of the human genome sequence appeared. And this is about three billion base pairs or pieces of information, and it cost about three billion US dollars to produce this first draft of the human genome sequence. Uh, this uh, project was heralded as the beginning of a new era in biomedicine. This is going to revolutionize the way we treat diseases. We're going to all have our genome sequenced, um, and then we'll be able to understand how to personalize medicine. So this was the promise of the Human Genome Sequencing Project. Well, to realize that promise, we obviously had to reduce the cost of sequencing genomes from $3 billion to something that could feasibly uh, be applied to everybody in this room. And this required the invention of better technologies, and these have appeared in the last few years. Oh, can I keep going forward? Um, and this is called next generation sequencing. It's been invented by and, and, and pioneered by a number of prominent scientists, including Lee Hood, who spoke here in this lecture series a, a month or so ago, or a couple of months ago. And this means that the, the cost of sequencing the human genome has now become about 1,000 US dollars, probably a bit more, but you could conceivably get your genome sequenced for about $1,000. So that obviously brings it within the realm of reality for medical diagnostics. So this is really quite remarkable in terms of what was um, available to us 10 years ago and what's available now. I don't think any scientist in this room would have predicted this kind of advance and that we'd be able to contemplate these kinds of experiments today. I, I certainly didn't. But it's revolutionized the types of experiments that we can do. So now we can produce this uh, genome sequence information. I could get uh, DNA from all of you, sequence your DNA, and I could give you back a list of all of the bases that make up your genome. As always, it's not at the information that counts, but how you interpret it. And I like this illustration here where there's a couple of doctors looking at some poor patient. They have this patient's genome sequence, and they're saying, well, you don't know why he's sick, but he's clearly a male homo sapiens. So obviously, the implication here is that knowing the genome sequence hasn't added anything to their ability to help this patient. And so what we really need to do is learn the rules of genomes and understand how they might be perturbed in diseases and exploit this wonderful technological capacity we have to help change the way we do medicine. And as said, I said here, we've really just scratched the surface of being able to do this. So this has led to the, a, a new field that Chris uh, talked about briefly, which is the field of functional genomics. And this field aims to take genome sequence information and understand the function of all the genes in cells, including in human cells, and then put all that information together to figure out how those gene networks are perturbed in disease. 
And so all of these sequence genomes have been coming online over the last decade or so. There's various numbers of genes in different organisms. As Chris mentioned, the yeast has about 6,000 genes, and people don't have that many more genes than yeast or fruit flies or C. elegans, really, and this was a big surprise to people. But nonetheless, this is a lot of information. People refer to this as a parts list for how these organisms might work. So we're here we have all the parts, and just like the factory analogy, we have to figure out how to put them together in order to understand what makes the organism work. So even if we stare, well, geez, if we stare at these uh, genome sequences, um, we, we discovered that most of the genes are relatively uncharacterized. Even though there's been many scientists working in many fields for many years doing genetics, we still don't understand the function of most genes. And even if we look at them, we can't infer their function very well. So this has led people to try to think of systematic methods to discover gene function. We should work on many genes at a time instead of one gene at a time in order to get a clearer picture of how genes work together to make cells function properly sort of go back to Chris's analogy about um, the cars and the factory. If you think about, you can get all the parts and you can figure out how to put it together to make a car. And sometimes you might um, not even know there's something wrong with the car. For example, suppose somebody ho had hooked up the uh, tuning button on the radio so that it actually turned the steering wheel. Well, you wouldn't even really figure out there was a problem. The per car is perfectly functional until you tried to turn on the radio when you careen off the road. So that's sort of an environment gene type interaction. We really have to understand how everything interacts to make a functional unit rather than just what each individual part might be doing. So as Chris beautifully um, introduced, uh, the system that we work on is the budding yeast uh, Saccharomyces cerevisiae, which is uh, very well known, of course, for its role in making things that we like to eat and drink. This is a little movie of yeast budding down here, and I think you can see why it's called the budding yeast. It replicates by growing a little tiny bud off the surface of the mother cell, and once that daughter gets big enough, it breaks off and the cycle continues until and the yeast uh, colony can grow. This organism has been a very useful organism for studying human cells because it's easy to work with, it grows rapidly, we can knock genes out, we can do all kinds of manipulations of its DNA. So it's really been one of the pioneer organisms for developing all of these technologies and methods that have been applied to other systems. And what we've helped to develop uh, in the community is automated protocols for doing genetics in a, in a very rapid and genome-wide way, and I'll tell you about that. So again, as, as Chris mentioned, the way that uh, geneticists and functional genomicists work is to break things and take a look at the cells, the phenotype, and try to infer what that gene must have been doing, the broken gene must have been doing in the wild-type cell. And here's a picture, for example, of some normal or wild-type yeast cells. They're nice and round and elliptical, and everything looks relatively um, even, or morphology is even. And here's a mutant strain of yeast that's defective in one gene. Supposing you don't even know what that gene does, now we're examining its phenotype. We're looking at it under the microscope, and we notice it has these really long, odd-looking buds. It's all misshapen. So you might conclude that the gene that's broken in this particular mutant background has some role in cell shape or cell division. And you'd be correct. That's a very general prediction, but then nonetheless, it's correct. And so geneticists have been using model systems like budding yeast and the small nematode worm C. elegans and the Drosophila fruit fly over years to do these kinds of genetic screens to try to find out um, how genes work. And about 10 years or so um, ago now, uh, the yeast community got together and decided to build reagents to do this type of experiment systematically. Since it seems to work pretty well, we can break things and then see what happens to the cell and infer what the gene must be doing. Let's make reagents so we can do it systematically. And the reagent that the community made is called the yeast deletion collection, the result of a community project called the yeast deletion project. And this project involved taking each gene in yeast, each of the 6,000 genes in yeast, and deleting it using methods of molecular biology and replacing it with an antibiotic resistance marker. And this created a, a large array or collection of strains, about 5,000 strains, in which each of the strains on the array is missing one and only one gene. And it's completely deleted for that gene. So one can imagine now you can take this collection and look at each of these individual strains, each of which is missing one gene, and do these kinds of experiments where you look at what's wrong, and now you'll be able to discover the function of all the genes in this wonderful model cell. So that's the idea of the project. It was a great idea, but very early on in the project, there was a really remarkable result. And that said, of these 6,000 uh, genes in yeast, 
uh, you could delete all but 1,000 or so of them. So you could delete one of any f of the, these 5,000 genes and not much happen to the cell. So it seemed that you could get rid of one of these 5,000 genes and the cell is perfectly fine. So if that's the case, how can you infer the function of the gene if you can't see any phenotype associated with its deletion? So this result really, I think, surprised a lot of people in the field, the extent to which this sort of buffering appeared to be happening. And when people look in other organisms, um, it seems that this kind of ratio of genes that when you delete them don't seem to cause an apparent problem is holding true. So this kind of problem with this redundancy needs to be addressed in order for us to do these kinds of experiments properly. In other words, we need to understand how genes interact in order to do these experiments in a systematic way. So sort of from this uh, big experiment, this big deletion project experiment, we can conclude that biological systems are really buffered. That means there must be backup pathways uh, in order to allow the cell to function if one pathway stops functioning properly. And so the way to define which genes work together and to back each other up, we reasoned, is let's make double mutants. If deleting one gene isn't enough, let's try deleting two genes in the same cell and maybe something will happen. That would be a genetic interaction. And in general, we need to address this problem, this redundancy, in order to understand how genes work in, in more complicated organisms like humans. So one type of uh, genetic interaction we decided to look at is called synthetic lethality. And it's diagrammed here with these sort of two pathways. And so what I'm showing you here is a, a, a diagram of two genes, A and B. And in normal cells, they're both functioning perfectly well, and the cell grows normally. And I just told you that often you can delete an individual gene like A, and the cell still functions perfectly well. And in this scenario, it would be because the B pathway is still working. So the cell is fine. It's buffered. Likewise, you can get rid of the B pathway by getting rid of this gene, and because the A pathway is there, again, the cell is perfectly fine because it's buffered from the consequences of this perturbation. But if we delete both of these genes in the same cell, making a double mutant, this might cause this whole system to collapse, and we'll see a very clear output like lethality. That's the most dramatic thing that we can, um, we can assay. And we knew from a lot of experiments that scientists had been doing that this type of genetic interaction, synthetic lethality, often identifies functional relationships. In other words, it tells you something about what genes are doing. So we thought it would be a good thing to study. So you're thinking, yeah, maybe a good thing to study, but why do it such a big project involving synthetic lethality? And we reasoned that if we did this all by all, we looked at how all yeast genes interact with all yeast genes, we could make maps of how the cell is wired sort of how the pathways in the cell work to keep the cell viable and functioning. So here again, I'm just showing these A and B pathways, only now I've included more members of the pathway. And suppose things really are set up like this, where there are these two parallel pathways functioning and allowing the cell to live. You can imagine that getting rid of any component of the red pathway would cause a genetic interaction with any component of the B pathway. And this results in what we call a little genetic interaction network here. And so we think that if we look at genes and look at who they interact with, this allows us to order them in these pathways and make these networks. And this will be very valuable for trying to understand uh, how cells work and ultimately produce a wiring diagram of the cell. And I'll come back to that in a bit. Uh, we were also motivated to look at synth synthetic lethality for a couple of other reasons. Uh, again, um, Chris, in her introductory comments, mentioned Lee Hartwell, who won the Nobel Prize um, in Physiology and Medicine for his work on cell cycle regulators. Uh, he also speculated uh, a 10 years ago or so now about how we're going to understand how genes interact in humans and lead to disease. And he wrote an essay in Science Magazine uh, that we found very interesting called The Principles for the Buffering of Genetic Variation. And he was really trying to foresee the problems we'd have with all the onslaught of genetic information coming from sequencing projects and how we'd interpret it. And he reasoned that if we're going to interpret something really complex, like human genetic disease, then we need maps. We need some sort of rules to understand how genes interact. And he suggested that we needed to do these experiments in very simple systems, like yeast. So we thought having a very smart man like Lee Hartwell tell us that we should do this big experiment was good enough for us, and we decided we should start, uh, start to build this map. And, uh, Lee also did some other thinking about synthetic lethality around the same time, together with his colleagues, including Andrew Murray, who's sitting here in the front row at this symposium. 
And they thought about what synthetic lethal genetic interactions might tell us about cancer. And the reason that this was interesting um, to us was this sort of idea where we know that cancer cells uh, typically have some sort of genetic lesion that you don't have in uh, normal cells in an individual. So for example, they might have a genetic mutation in a gene that's normally involved in, in suppressing tumor formation. These are called tumor suppressor genes. And there might be, and there's lots of other genes, of course, in these cells, but cancer cells uniquely carry these mutations, whereas normal cells do, know, do not. And uh, Lee Hartwell and his colleagues speculated that there may be genes that you can inactivate in the cancer cell that would cause a synthetic lethal interaction only in the presence of the lesion that's in the cancer cell. So if you could find a drug that would hit that gene, then you might kill the cancer cell, but not normal cells. Obviously, this is, would make a very good cancer chemotherapeutic, much better than the more general inhibitors of cell division we use now. So this would be a synthetic lethal interaction specific to cancer cells. And in fact, there's been some very um, interesting examples of how this has worked in actual uh, human cancers. One example is a, a genetic interaction with uh, cancer cells that are mutated in the BRCA gene, BRCA1 gene, which is commonly found in certain types of breast cancer. And people discovered that mutations in the BRCA1 gene were synthetically lethal with mutations in another gene called PARP1. And it turns out there was already drugs out there, Oloperid, that's in, that uh, is, is used to inhibit this PARP1 gene for other purposes. So they were able to give this drug to people who had cancer with mutations in BRCA1 to help treat their breast cancer. So this is using knowledge of genetic interactions to tailor therapeutics to particular types of cancer. And this is becoming a growing field in oncology. And in fact, uh, the, I looked on the internet and there's a number of meetings that are occurring specifically to discuss uh, the synthetic lethal approaches to cancer. And so I think this is uh, going to be a growing area as we learn more and more about genetic interactions. So we don't study cancer cells. As uh, I've mentioned to you, we use the budding yeast model to try to understand how genes interact. And again, around the time that people were thinking about this, when those essays came out from Hartwell and colleagues, um, we recruited Charlie Boone to the University of Toronto. And Charlie was very interested in thinking about how we could use the yeast deletion collection to address this genetic redundancy. Here's this great reagent. It's got all these single mutants. Let's just make double mutants. Let's make all of them. And let's try to see which double mutant combinations cause synthetic lethality. So the project, since yeast has 6,000 genes, as you heard, is to make uh, six sort of an all by all double mutant uh, combinations that's looking at 36 million double mutant combinations for synthetic lethality. So that's a pretty uh, big project, and it was pretty clear that to do this in a reasonable way, we needed a method. The way that yeast geneticists usually do this kind of experiment is by sitting at a microscope and moving yeast cells around. This is not going to work for 36 million of these types of experiments. So uh, Amy Tong, when she was a graduate student in our group, uh, invented a method that she calls uh, the synthetic genetic array or SGMA method that automates yeast genetics and allows us to manipulate the, these arrays very easily in the lab so that we can do these experiments on large scale. And uh, Charlie's daughter, Hannah Boone, made a claymation, uh, which I couldn't resist. <laughs> <laughs> uh, not showing you here. So here's two different yeast cells. These are yeast cells from our, our deletion collection. And when yeast get together and they're the right mating types, they mate and they form a diploid cell. So they're haploid cells, they come together, they combine their genomes. And at the beginning of that video, the genes are colored so that each of the cells carries a deletion in a different gene. Then you place the yeast on a different type of media and it encourages them to grow through the process of meiosis, just like our gametes. And then all of these products are enclosed in this ascus, which you can remove. And now what we want to do is select for this double mutant and get rid of all these single mutants and wild type cells that we don't want. And we've included some nice tricky markers in our starting strain so that we can do ju this just by changing the food that the yeast are growing on. So we're going to now move all these yeast onto new media. That means that some of these guys can't grow. And the only yeast that can grow is this guy here, the double mutant that we want to study. Did you find that at all useful? Charlie loves that. <laughs> Charlie loves that clamation. It's kind of cool that somebody sat down and did that. But in any case, the, the idea is that we can now do this yeast genetics very rapidly simply by pinning the yeast onto different types of food. And this is just a more scientific demonstration of the method that Amy invented. 
And really the way that we're looking at the data is we're looking at these arrays of yeast plates, and here's some single mutants, and here's some double mutants, and we're just measuring the size of the colonies that the yeast form after we pin them onto the food. And that alone tells us whether or not there's a genetic interaction between these two mutations that we're combining in the same cell. So here's an example of an actual plate, and I think you can see there's some mutants on here that aren't growing very well relative to their neighbors. We also needed to build some technology to automate this process, and so we collaborated with Sasan Ragabazada uh, in the mechanical engineering department, and he was making information for different types of biology experiments, and he helped us design some robots for doing this replica pinning procedure. This is a picture of our, uh, our lab in the Donnelly Center. It's usually not that clean, but that's what it looks like. And here's a picture of an old version of the robot. Just to illustrate to you, they're fairly simple. We just have to have the robot take the lid off these plates where the yeast are growing on their food. And then this is a pinhead with floating pinheads. So it can be lowered onto the yeast plate and then pick up the yeast on the pins and then go and move it onto another plate with other food. So you go through this replica pinning procedure and you get an output array with your double mutants that we can measure by looking at the colony size. So a couple of years ago, we published a fairly large study, or genetic interaction network, using this methodology. Uh, this project was led by Michael Costanzo, uh, a senior research associate in our group. And the data analysis was done by Anastasia Brznikova, a graduate student, uh, together with Chad Myers, who's a professor at the University of Minnesota. And together, they did almost 2,000 of those screens that I was just telling you about, uh, looking at how these genes interacted with that deletion array. And that means they tested 5.4 million gene pairs for these synthetic lethal interactions. And that's 30% of all the possible combinations. Uh, this project is ongoing. We're going to try to finish it just because we should, I think. But nonetheless, we decided to uh, stop and analyze these data to look at the information that we were getting. Now, one of the big challenges with any of these types of large-scale experiments is actually analyzing the data. Once you set up the method, and you set up the screening tools and technologies, you can generate the data. It's just like genome sequences. You can get a lot of information very quickly. How do you look at that information and extract something that's meaningful? And a lot of people refer to this as the hairball problem in the field. Now, supposing we took all 5.4 million of those data points, and we just took them and we joined them by a line, and they joined them to each other whenever there was some sort of interaction. Well, you might get something that looks like this. And it is actually called the hairball problem because really you can't look at that and discover any useful information. And so our, our, our solution was Chad, who looked at these data and said, well, let's not look at each individual data point. Let's try to group things together so that we can extract relevant information. And this looks um, pretty science-y, but nonetheless, I'm going to explain it to you because this is Chad's idea. He said, let's make correlation-based networks. And all that means, and I'm going to show you these wiring diagrams, is that each of the nodes here on these diagrams is one of these genes that we've done one of these mutant screens with. And then it's joined to another gene. And this edge represents how many genetic interactions they share in common. You remember at the beginning, I told you we wanted to make these pathways and look at genetic interactions shared between different genes. That's exactly the way Chad decided to display the data. But the trick is, the closer you are on the network, it's like a spring, the more interactions you share in common, the more related you are. If you share interactions but not as many, you'd be further apart. So this is called an edge-weighted spring-embedded layer. So this allows you to kind of put things close together on the map that are very related. And so the next slide shows the uh, correlation map uh, that Chad was able to produce. There's 2,800 genes on here and 10,000 edges. So these are all genetic interaction profiles that we're looking at. And you're going to sit there at the back and go, still looks like a hairball to me. So what we really have to do then is look at this map and say, what information is in there? And I think you can appreciate that in this map, there are these obvious clusters, these genes that are clustering together. And so we can go through and ask, is there something we know about the, those genes? Is there something that they share in common? And in fact, there is. We see that this little cluster here represents genes with known roles in replicating DNA. And we can wander around this map and sort of assign function to all of these clusters. So that's why we call this a wiring diagram of the cell, because when we look at it, and this is just measuring one type of genetic interaction, we can pretty much visualize all the processes in the cell and how they're connected. And we think that's uh, important for understanding how they might be perturbed uh, in disease. Um, I, one of the big goals, as I mentioned, of functional genomics projects is to try to assign function to unknown genes. So what I've done here is just put a red dot 
on any gene on this map where the function's completely unknown. And given what we know about the information in this network then, we would predict that all of these little red dots that fall within this cluster have some previously unappreciated role in DNA replication, for example. So I think this map has motivated a lot of yeast scientists as well as other scientists to look at the map and then do experimental tests to find out if these predictions are true. And it actually appears to be uh, quite uh, rich in functional information so that these predictions can be quite accurate. So what we've learned from this sort of proof of principle map where we've done a couple of thousand of these screens is that these networks really do uh, define connections between processes and have produced a very nice wiring diagram of the cell. One thing that we're really interested in now is whether or not we truly can use this map, not just to understand in general how genes interact, but can we use it to predict uh, genetic interactions in more complex cells? And the answer is probably yes, because we're starting to do experiments with other colleagues that show that these genetic interactions are likely conserved. And our real goal here is to now apply this information to, as I mentioned, more complex systems like humans. We all know that humans have extensive genetic variation. We know that from the number of genome sequences that have been produced. And which of these genes or combinations of genes are important for certain phenotypes? For example, in particular, a complex disease phenotypes. And we think that because, as Chris mentioned, yeast genes are conserved, their interactions and genetic networks will be conserved as well. And you know, why is this important? It's important just to come back to what I was saying at the beginning because our current healthcare models typically involve uh, going to the doctor and getting uh, some sort of diagnosis based on a history, a medical history, or, just, or doing some tests. You're monitored, and then if it seems that you need some treatment, the uh, treatment is applied. Um, the new paradigm that people see coming down the line as we start to understand genetic information better is that we'll be able to use the genetic information to sort of uh, do uh, earlier diagnosis and take preventative action, so more preventative medicine than reactive medicine that we're doing now. This may allow us to design new and better drugs, and obviously if we intervene early in a preventable disease, we can improve survival or the quality of life. And again, it's interesting to think about why this is important. I think it's obvious, but there are many diseases that are, uh, for which pre-symptomatic diagnosis would be valuable, like cardiac disease. And this is a nice quote illustrating the power of uh, pre-symptomatic diagnosis. In about 20% of patients, sudden death is the first sign of heart disease. So clearly, if we knew that these people were predisposed to heart disease, we may be able to either start some treatments or um, uh, intervene in lifestyle so that they could uh, have a better quality of life. The other thing that people view as particularly promising is the field of pharmacogenomics, where again, we can look at the information in a person's DNA and predict whether or not they'll have a response to a drug. So there are many types of cancer uh, drugs, for example, that are not useful for you unless you have a particular mutation, and they might have toxic side effects. So why take that drug unless you're going to respond? And also, there are many, many uh, toxic side effects from taking drugs. This is a serious uh, problem in the medical community, and we should be able to develop genetic tests for whether or not you'll have, to have an adverse drug response. So this alone would be a very valuable outcome from understanding genetic interactions and how our genomes work. And there are some really cool examples of this uh, that are emerging now. I think we've got a long way to go, and we can talk about this in the discussion section, in terms of applying our knowledge of human genetics and genetic interactions to actual treatment of people. But uh, just late last year, there was an interesting article in the New York Times about a scientist named Lucas Wartman, who was actually studies leukemia and treats leukemia, and he developed it himself. Uh, he had conventional treatment and went into remission, but then his cancer recurred. And it was looking uh, very bad for him. There were no treatments that the doctors could offer him. And he worked at an institute where his colleagues said, um, well, why don't we just sequence your genome and take a look at what's happening? And really, as I just I, I said to you, there wasn't, it wasn't clear that this would be useful at all. But when they sequenced uh, Lucas's genome, they found one aberration in a gene called FLT3, which was actually a known oncogene, and people had developed a drug that inhibits this particular gene for another type of cancer, for kidney cancer. So this is not a drug that any doctor would have prescribed to this individual. He had leukemia, and this drug was specifically used in treating kidney cancer. But because he had this genetic problem, they started giving him this drug, which was approved and already for this other cancer, and he went into remission again. So cancer is complicated. 
there are probably going to be other issues with um, Dr. Wortman's cancer, but nonetheless, this is a nice example of where his genome sequence information allowed application of an existing therapy to help his particular case. So some key questions that I see and that I'm, I'm happy to discuss with you or any other questions that you have um, are, are we learning anything about the fundamental principles of genetic networks from studying these, these simple organisms? How are these networks altered in diseases? And there's other big questions associated with the ethical implications of studying our genomes and letting, having that information available, and what does that mean for uh, medical practitioners and doctors? And, and their patients. So uh, there's many, many questions that arise from this, and I'm happy to discuss them. I'd just like to close, though, by thanking again the people that I've been mentioning uh, throughout my talk. Uh, this remarkable person here, Michael Costanzo, really leads that large genetic interaction project. Um, he's been with us for the past 10 years, and he works with a team of technicians who run those robots and produce our data. As I mentioned, Anastasia Baryshnikova um, was a great graduate student in the group. She's now at Princeton as a Lewis Sigler fellow. And Chad Myers leads our computational group. Uh, Michael Skypes with Chad every day to talk about our data as it's coming off the pipeline. And this is a picture of uh, our lab. That's the view from our lab. That's the CN Tower in, in downtown Toronto. It's not like that right now. It's very cold and snowy there. So I'm happy to be here. <laughs> I'm happy to answer questions. Thank you, very insightful talk. I have two questions. The first one is, if you took those 1,000 essential genes and overlaid them on that map, based on the first statement you made about them being uh, maybe a single pathway, that's why, you would predict that some of these would probably fall outside of the hubs? Have you tried it? Yeah, we've done some work with the essential genes. That's a, a good question. And essential genes themselves tend to be hubs on the network. And so we have done experiments where we're crossing all of the essential gene mutants to each other. And they do seem to have different properties where they interact with a lot of other genes and they represent all of the biological processes that we can see. So they tend to be much more connected in, in the genetic interaction network. So they are more connected than yeah. the, so there are multiple pathways yes. that are interacting. And that's possibly why they're essential. Yeah. And that so and then my other question is if you're gonna use this system to kind of predict possibilities, how do you deal with the sensitivity issue? Like what I mean is, for example, when you were looking in the past, when they first people started looking at using proteomics, for example. It was the sensitivity of how much protein can you detect that oh. allowed. So at, at the end of the day, it was you'd, you'd end up with always the same usual suspect, the ones that you can detect. So you have the same issue here because you've got the hubs that are probably the most sensitive that you could. That yeah. Whatever. So, so uh, how do you clean uh, that another up? Another way of uh, putting your question is that we're only looking at one thing here. We're looking at whether or not the cells grow very poorly when we combine these mutations. So there, you can imagine there's lots of combinations of mutations that could cause a problem, but not that problem. And so we're going to miss those. And sure enough, there's a, a, about 20% of the genes that we try to look at, we don't see a genetic interaction profile. So they're not going to get on our map. So our approach to that is to look in different conditions. So there's probably a lot of situations in which genes are only required in, in some conditions. So we're trying to figure that out. Um, and, all, and also using other assays, using more sensitive assays, like getting inside the cell and looking at specific subcellular structures. So that's another whole side to the story. Yes. Yes. Uh, hi. The, uh, the oncogenes are the, these associated. The, the oncogenes or the, these genes associated with cancer, are any of them uh, non essential? And if so, is it like proportionally split? between the, uh, the, the non-essential and essential parts of the human genome, or is it? Well, no? the problem is that it's harder to measure what's an essential gene or a non-essential gene in, in human in, or in any kind of developing or multicellular organism. So people don't really know the answer to how many genes are essential. They're inferring from a subset of experiments. Uh, there are some genes that, when mutated, lead to cancer that are not essential. We know that from, say, making the mutations in mice. So we predict they're not. Um, you could get rid of them, and it wouldn't um, be lethal in humans. But it's, it's not that clear. Thank you. That was a <clears throat> fascinating lecture. Um, I want to talk about uh, money. <laughs> OK. Um, there, I, 
As far as I can recall, in part of the Human Genome Project, there was some effort to monetize, specifically to privatize some of this information. And this is in complete contradistinction to the kind of open source and sharing that we have in the scientific community. Do you, the first question is, do you see this as a, a possible um, a threat to uh, further development in this field? Right? Well, yeah. That's the first question. The second question is, uh, this is amazing work, uh, and it falls on from the first question. There are companies, commercial companies available now, uh, that will sequence your uh, DNA, 23andMe, and so on and so yeah. forth. That will take uh, the sequence it for, as you say, under a thousand bucks. Not the complete genome, but part of it. Do you, in the in the in the idea that you know, a little knowledge is dangerous if it's given to the end consumer. Do you think that the that that there is a role for 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 these kind of companies uh, at the moment? Okay. So, so your first question was about the uh, initial sort of parallel effort from a private company to sequence the human genome. Well, the bottom line is that it was sequenced by a consortium of science, scientists funded by public money is put in the public domain. And now it's easy enough that these genomes are being sequenced, human genomes are being sequenced in labs all over the world. So it's essentially not an issue anymore. People can get this kind of information easily. So companies can figure out ways to patent discoveries, but the general issue of availability of this information to scientists I don't think is an issue. Um, and 23andMe. Right, so a little, yeah, a little information can be uh, dangerous. It's very important to think about what people will do with the information. And this kind of gets back to my point about understanding things and what it can tell you. Like, so for example, a lot of genetics is probability. So uh, you look at you and I say, okay, I've sequenced your genome and, uh, or I've sequenced your fetus's genome. And uh, your fetus has a 20% uh, higher than uh, average chance of getting heart disease and dying by the age of 50. What would you do with that information? I mean, that's a probability. It's kind of hard to grasp that. It's, it's going to occur over a long period of time. And so this is the type of information that's mostly going to be provided. And so I think at uh, the same time, there's a large need to develop uh, training for physicians and genetic counselors and other people to help uh, patients understand information that they're getting. Otherwise, it could be quite shocking. I mean, we, we, we could have our genome sequenced and we're all going to find uh, you know, dozens of mutations in our genomes that we know are in essential genes, getting back to your question, and we're running around alive. But still, it's sort of frightening. Yeah, my name is Fatia. Actually, the reason why I'm here today is that um, I'm going to talk about the fact my mom has a weird cancer for the last four years, and it goes from one place to another. Uh, she's in Morocco, and I, I'm not sure if in Morocco we have enough financial support to do all of this research. So um, my question is how these studies and research can help people directly. Are the doctors go and do the, 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 the necessary tests and then doing the necessary studies and research, mm -hmm. or it, it is only for future cure of disease? Because I know that still people dying of cancer and heart disease and other disease. Yeah, we, Thank we all, you. Yeah, yeah, we all know people. My, my father has a, a type of uh, leukemia at the moment. And uh, I think we're doing actually a fairly bad job of translating these type of basic discoveries into the clinic. And I think there's a variety of reasons for that. But as I just mentioned in response to the last question, a lot of it is that you, you can generate the information, but you need um, a receptor. You need a physician that understands that information. You need very rapid, a way to rapidly translate these findings to the clinic. I think that's starting to happen, but the truth is that we still treat cancer a lot like we used to treat, we, we treated it 20 years ago with the same types of drugs. Um, the availability of these treatments will vary by country to country, by, by healthcare system, but the good thing about science is it's very open and international, again getting back to uh, what was asked before and even this type of meeting. So I think uh, these advances are translated much more rapidly than they were in the past. So I think that gives us hope. I'm hopeful that within a few years, uh, we'll see very dramatic changes in the way we treat cancer. But right now, there are examples like the one I gave you. But for the most part, people aren't getting this type of treatment. I was just wondering um, what the relationship between a <clears throat> synthetic lethal network and gene expression network is. I imagine they're quite distinct 
Yeah, they, they are pretty distinct. So we, because we are working in this yeast model, there's lots of other data we can overlap with the network. And we don't get a whole lot of information by overlapping gene expression networks. Where we do get information is overlapping protein interaction networks. And there's various ways that we can predict protein interactions from our data. So it's very helpful to combine these data. Yeah. Thank you. I apologize if you've answered this earlier. Um, so when you have these genes which you decide are paired because when they're when they have a paired mutation, you knock something out over there. If those two genes are also conserved in, let's say, the human genome, do we assume or do we know that then they are paired there as well? well we, we don't know. And so what we have to do is test that. And it's a lot harder to do those tests in human cells, but we are collaborating with people who work with, for example, example cancer cell lines. And we take our yeast network and we look for genes that have their, that we look for their counterparts in the human cell lines, and we're doing knockdown or knockout experiments to test that. But those experiments are early days, something we're very interested in. Uh -huh.